Well, let's bow together in a word of prayer as we come to the Word of God. Our loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here again, to be singing your praises, to be seeing each other, the other members of the family of God. We thank you for your grace in making this happen today. And we ask as we come to your word that you would please give us humble hearts, open minds, and a desire to live obediently for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we are taking part in a historic day in the life of Foothill Bible Church. This being our first gathering since taking a hiatus for the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, as far as I know, this campus had seen an unbroken chain of 2,878 worship services until March 15th, 2020, when that ended. And yet here we are, gathered again, and the ticker goes back to one. But we're, we're going to see that number continue to rise, because we're going to continue to meet by God's grace. Now, obviously, we're not back to normal. Uh, All of our members are not comfortable returning yet, and we have many restrictions in place, but today begins our slow return to that normal, Lord willing. Now, as a society, we are, and we have, and are continuing to learn many things in the midst of these events. And the same is true for the church. We've gained a newfound appreciation for things. You know how the phrase goes, you don't know what you've got until it's gone. And I think we all realize that once there was a lot of things gone for us there in March, we began to realize what we had. A lot was taken away, and slowly it's coming back. And in the process, we're learning what a great treasure we did have. And one of those things that we're learning is that the church is unique. The church is not just a social club of people with common interests who want to get together again for some surface reason. You know, we are the body of Christ. We are a family. We are brothers and sisters united in Jesus. We have something that binds us together that is even tighter and stronger than family relationships. And yet that bond could have gone one of two ways over these last two and a half months. It could have, on one side, it could have strengthened our love for the church. It could have strengthened our relationships. We could have realized all that we have in our heart. could have grown in our love for those whom we have not been able to see and not been able to meet with. In other words, it could have reinforced our connection to the body of Christ. But it could have done something else as well. It could have weakened our attachment to the church. In fact, this week I read of a Barna study that was done just recently that said that 48% of churchgoers hadn't made an effort to watch church online in the last four weeks. So even though everyone has been in their homes, of those who mark themselves as a churchgoer, the last four weeks they hadn't participated in that. And of the 52% who had participated or watched a service, a surprising 23% streamed a different church than their own. That means that among the churchgoers that Barna surveyed, only 29% have continued to stay connected with their home church. And I believe that these statistics simply speak of the shallow connection that many people had with their church fellowship before COVID hit. The quarantine orders have only revealed what was there in reality. And yet... In Christ, the church is one. That is a theological reality. Jesus prayed on the night before he went to the cross that his disciples would be one 
as he and the Father were one. Galatians 3, verse 28 says, you are all one in Christ. And so, Romans 12, 5, we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We share a unity together in Jesus Christ. But there have been forces that have been hacking away at our unity in recent weeks. These forces have by no means destroyed it, but if we aren't careful, if we aren't vigilant, those forces could weaken our unity as a body. I want to highlight just what three of those threats potentially are. And these threats could have attacked our own hearts all differently, not to say that it was the same across the board, but these are possible things that could have weakened our unity in the recent weeks. The first is just simply that we have not been able to see one another. God made us to be social creatures. We were made in his image, which means that we have the capacity for relationship and for connection and for conversation, something as unique as the crown of his creation. We are made in his image. And so when we don't see people, we lose touch with them. It's just a fact of life, whether it's college friends that uh, you, you no longer see anymore or, or friends that you once were close to and then have moved away. If you don't see each other, it's hard to stay connected. And so our lack of physical presence has been a threat. But another threat has just been the fact, combined with that, is that our worship services have not been in person. Because, you see, when we're together and we uh, see one another and we are uh, seeing one another as we sing and as we pray and as we listen to the Word of God, it has a strengthening component to our hearts to realize that we are not alone, that we stand united as we worship the one true and holy God. We are encouraged just by our presence together as we worship. And so our two and a half months of online services have the possibility of threatening our unity. Maybe not by much, but I believe it's had a weakening effect. But the third, and I believe the most detrimental threat to us, is the number of issues that are dividing Americans right now. We are living in a divided country, and those divisions are showing themselves every day. Even before the events of the past week, there were plenty enough divisions to spark up fiery debate with anybody you talk to. And the reality is, is that because we're all in the same boat, you could pull over anybody on the side of the street, you could talk to anybody at the grocery store, and you all had a common experience. And again, you could get varying opinions about the things that have been going on. Opinions about face coverings. Opinions about what's been closed. Opinions about what's been opened. Opinions about when this is all going to end, about a possibility of a vaccine. I mean, even those on this campus right now hold varying opinions about all these issues and many more. And then you throw in the events of this past week and you see other fissures, other lines of division within our society that the church is not necessarily immune to. These contentious debates, I believe, have a strong, are a strong threat to our bonds of unity within Foothill Bible Church. And so as we begin gathering here today, I want us to bolster our unity together. Let us reaffirm our commitment to one another as our extension of our commitment to Christ. Because we love Jesus, we love his bride, and we love his church, and we have covenanted together as Foothill Bible Church that we are committed to one another as followers of of Jesus. And so we're going to look this morning at three actions that we must take to bolster our unity. These are not going to be rocket science. They're not going to be brand new for you, but I trust they're a good reminder as we step back into interacting with one another. And so the first action that we must take is simply to cherish our unity. We must cherish our unity. Because Friends, if this church is to, re, is to remain united in one mind and one heart, then we must cherish the unity that we have. And this unity is not automatic. In other words, it's not 
just that uh, something happened or that we had common interests and it just so happens that we all showed up at the same place and go, oh, this is great. No, the, our unity as a church was purchased with blood. We are here today because Jesus went to the cross on our behalf, not only to save us individually, but to save us corporately. He purchased the church with his own blood. We get this from Acts 20, verse 28, where it says, the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Jesus obtained the church with his own blood. And now you might be thinking, why would the church need to be obtained with blood? Why, what's, why does unity need to be purchased with blood? That seems a little extreme. But the churches need to be purchased with blood because the divisions within society, within humanity, were so great. And we see this particularly in Ephesians chapter 2. And so I invite you to open your copy of God's Word to Ephesians chapter 2. Turn there, tap there, however you can, can get to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 11 through 22. Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 22. It says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the, the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now from this passage, I just want to highlight a couple notes of observation for us. First is the unmistakable reality of hostility. That there was hostility not only between us and God, our holy creator, but there was hostility between mankind. And again, the history of humanity shows this beginning with Cain and Abel very in the first book of the Bible. As soon as sin entered the world, those brothers experienced conflict and hostility. And that has persisted ever since. And yet... As Paul makes clear here, the only thing to break down that dividing wall of hostility, the only thing to be able to bring humanity together, to be unified together, is the cross of Jesus Christ, is the blood of the Lord. The cross changed it all to create something unique, to create something that we call the church, to create what Paul identifies here as one new man, rather than two men, two people, Jews and Gentiles in this passage, but bringing them together to be one new man called the household of God, the temple in the Lord. The church is a new entity created by the Spirit. And it's only here in the church by those who have been brought near by the blood of Jesus is there a true unity found. This 
is where the hostility amongst people and in our world is able to find peace. Is in the church through the cross. So how do we cherish our unity? We cherish our unity by looking to Jesus Christ. The one who went to the cross on our behalf. The one who was crucified, buried and rose again for us. So that we can be here in newness of life. So that we can be united in him. Be accepted to the Father because of Jesus. He has transformed each one of us. This room and the rooms on campus and the rooms uh, in people's homes as we are all scattered are testimony to the transforming grace of God as each one of us have been touched and changed by the Spirit. And so we need to cherish our unity by looking to Jesus and praising Him for obtaining and purchasing us with His own blood. But in order to bolster our unity, we not only need to cherish it, we need to fight for our unity. That's the second action we need to take. We need to fight for our unity. Now, we have just been talking in terms of unity and Jesus, and this is, this is a true theological reality, whether you like it or not. This is the reality of the gospel, is that the, all of us in Jesus are unified through him. But as we know, in all areas of the Christian life, that there are theological realities, there are truths that are true of us all the time, but that we must work out practically in our everyday lives. For example, Romans 6 tells us that we're dead to sin, and therefore we cannot let sin reign in our mortal bodies. Well, that theological reality that we're dead to sin has to take daily expression in in not letting sin reign in our mortal bodies. The same is true with our unity. The unity is true. We are unified in Jesus Christ. But it must take daily expression of us fighting for that unity to to see that we are truly unified, one heart and of one mind. Just because we are one in Christ doesn't mean that we automatically get along. It doesn't mean that we all work instantly, harmoniously together. Unity is something that must be fought for. It must be eagerly maintained and diligently pursued. Without that effort required, the church will begin to fray at the edges and even split down the middle. It's a sad reality that church splits is a common word in the church vocabulary. And the fact that even many of you listening have experienced a church split. Sin can divide even the church if we are not fighting for unity. And yet, God commands us to fight. He commands us to work hard at preserving the unity that we have. I want you to see this in Ephesians, already there, look in chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We'll just read the first three verses. Paul writes, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It's interesting here that as Paul has spent the first three chapters talking about the theological reality of the gospel, his first application as he comes, turns the corner here in chapter 4 and begins to talk about what the gospel should look like in our lives, living up to the calling, being worthy of the calling to which we've been called that he had described in chapters 1 through 3. His first application is the unity of the church. It's not just looking at the holiness of our own lives, which is maybe where we would turn to first. But Paul looks at the the corporate gathering and says, says, you guys need to be unified. And he begins by talking about virtues that Jesus manifested and therefore should be manifested in our lives. Talking about humility and gentleness and patience. Forgiveness, bearing with one another in love. We are to exhibit the virtues that Christ manifested in order to keep the unity that Christ has created. This is a unity given to us by Christ. And we must work hard at it. Paul uses some strong language. In the English Standard Version, it says, being eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, verse 3. 
The word eager here means to be very careful to accomplish a duty. This word often entails the idea of making every effort or taking pains to make something happen. You are going to exert all your energy and have all your attention focused on this to make it happen. Be eager. Make every effort. Be diligent. In other words, Paul doesn't say that unity is something that we should just get around to doing at some point. But it's something that we should throw ourselves into and devote our lives to, giving every effort into it. But on top of this, we are to be eager to maintain or to keep our unity. The word translated maintain here, it, in its most basic sense, means to keep. In this context, it has the force of holding on to something and not letting go, not losing it. Hence the translation maintain or preserve or keep. And so to, to summarize what he's saying here in verse 3 is that he's saying that we as a church need to make every effort to hold on to the unity that we have in Jesus and not let it go. We can't relax our grip. We can't let it float away from us. We are a congregation of diverse people from all sorts of backgrounds. And we are seeing our world changing all around us. And we're all trying to figure out how Jesus wants us to live right now. But we can't allow these things to drive a wedge between us. We can't allow these issues to keep us from our task here of being eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Even though we may have different opinions, even though we may have differing convictions, we know that our task is to make every effort to preserve, to keep our unity. In the church, we've got to fight. And not fight for our rights, for our freedoms, for our preferences, but for our unity, as Paul commands us. So how do we fight? Three suggestions for us how we fight for this. Number one, we need to repent of selfish ambition. We need to repent of selfish ambition ambition. In light of the coronavirus, I came across one author who wrote the following. He says, I want to remind you that something deadly is still out there. Truly, there remains in the world a constant threat to the health of churches and the safety of its members. It easily spreads through human interactions, sometimes so easily and subtly that no one notices its transference. Only one church member may be affected. But if churches aren't careful, that one member can spread this deadly illness to every member in a matter of moments. No matter your age or health, every member is vulnerable to this terrible disease. And he ends with this. I'm not talking about COVID-19. I'm talking about selfish ambition. You see, self Selfish ambition may not have been on your radar as of late, but it is all near on our hearts. And God wants us to be aware of selfish ambition, be aware of our pride, and to cast it aside, to repent of it. Let's look briefly at Philippians chapter 2. One book over, Philippians chapter 2. Look in verse 1. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. One of the key signs of the work of the Spirit in our individual lives and in our church is a concern for other people, a looking out for how other people are doing, looking out for their interests. This is what a healthy church looks like, a community of people who care for one another, 
to look out for the interests and the needs of each other. You see, the flesh naturally looks out for itself. We don't need any help with that. What is a mark of the Spirit, those who walk by the Spirit, are concerned of the interests of others. And so, if we're to fight for unity, friends, we must repent and renounce of all selfish ambition in our hearts. We must look for where pride rises up, for it demands for its way, and seek to lay that aside, to put it off, to repent of it because it grieves the Lord to see it in us. I ask you, have you seen selfish ambition and pride rise up in your heart recently? As you think about the perspectives of other members, other people that maybe you've seen on social media or you've talked to them, are you tempted to harbor bitterness or condemning thoughts? Do you honestly consider yourself to be better than other members because of your perspective? We need to ask ourselves these hard questions that we might fight for the unity of the church. May God help us to see our sin and to repent of it so that we might walk in unity. Satan would love nothing more than in the midst of this worldwide chaos to tear this fellowship apart. He's been tearing churches apart for thousands of years and he does it the same exact way. He does it through the sins of its people. Their pride as then they turn against one another. Now, we will be taking communion here in a few minutes. I encourage you, even now, to begin searching your heart, to be looking for, are, is there sins that you need to repent of? Is there selfish ambition or pride that has been sitting there for days, for weeks, that you need to lay aside, that you need to repent of before you come to the table, before you can truly take these elements in unity with the body of Christ? We need to check our hearts. So the first way we fight for unity is to repent of our selfish ambition. The second way we fight is to put on love. Put on love. It's simply the other side of the coin. If we put off selfish ambition, we need to be putting on love. Because love is what binds the church together. It's what binds us all. We love because he first loved us. So our love for each other is an overflow of the gospel in our lives. Because you see those people that are sitting six feet apart from you and that you're staying distant from right now, those are people bought by the blood of Christ. Those are people that Jesus Christ died for and will one day be rejoicing around the throne with you. We can only love them because Jesus loved them. So I love you because Jesus loves you not just because I'm following his example, although there is a sense of that, but because I'm linked to you in Christ. I'm not just following Jesus' example, but there's a, there's a reality in which I, I am united with you because we are united through a common Savior. And therefore, we are fellow heirs of the glorious inheritance in Christ. And so we must devote ourselves to love one another. Love is not just this warm, fuzzy feeling we get inside. It is a decision to do good. It is, a, it is a, not just an operation of the emotions, but an operation of the will where we choose to move towards people to do them good. So we don't just sit around until we wait till the feelings of love come. We decide to love, and we move out in that love. Paul makes this clear in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 He says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. Verse 14, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. We must put on love if we are going to be a unified church. The third way we fight for unity is to pray for unity. We need to be praying for it. We must ask God to hold us together. We must plead with Him to not cause our differences to, to pull us apart. We must ask Him to increase our love for one another. We must pray this for Foothill Bible Church. 
that God would cause us to have such harmony with one another that we'd be able to unite in one voice in glorifying our God and Savior. God is the one who grants the unity, and we must ask Him for it. So to bolster our, uni- bolster our unity, we need to cherish it, we need to fight for it, and third and lastly, we need to demonstrate. We need to demonstrate our unity. You see, unity cannot just stay in our minds and in our hearts. It can't just continue to be a good idea. It's got to be result in some good actions. And this can be shown in many ways. We can show our unity when we simply show up together every week. We show our unity when we pray together and we sing together. That unity of voice, that unison, shows that we are together. We show our unity when we put others' needs above our own. And so I ask you, do you know the needs of others in the body? Do you know how you might serve and how you might bless and how you might look out for the other needs of people in the church? Now, many of you have been demonstrating this in phenomenal ways over the last couple months. And I pray we continue to lean into our oneness in Christ and to recognize that those people that maybe you don't know that well, but you know that we're united together here as a body of Christ, and so I'm going to reach out to them and find out how they're doing, see if they have any needs I can, I can meet. Even as we, our society begins to open up and our gatherings begin again, And we'd be looking for ways that we can serve, looking for ways we can put others' needs above our own. That we might show to a watching world how the gospel affects our lives, both individually and corporately. Jesus changes everything. Now the way that Jesus ordered his disciples to demonstrate their fellowship with one another was in an ordinance that we call the Lord's Table and the, or the Lord's Supper or Communion. And this ordinance, God, uh, Christ designed for the church to practice on a regular basis in order to demonstrate, to show off, and to remind the church of their unity together. Now, even though we, for convenience sake, have individual breads and individual cups, theologically, we are partaking of one bread and one cup. I think this is important to realize. This isn't just a a private experience that you're having with God as you take these elements. This is meant to be a corporate practice as we all partake of one bread and of one cup together, even though we split it up for convenience sake. And we get this reality, listen to this, in 1 Corinthians 10, where Paul writes this. He says, the cup of blessing, referring to the cup of communion that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. That's what's happening when we partake of these elements together. We are partaking of these, this one bread and this one cup to show our unity together. And we now have that privilege of participating in this communion together. And so you should have received your uh, small packet when you came in this morning. You can take that out now. This is something that we have been eagerly awaiting along with our singing, something that we have not been able to do for many weeks, and yet we're able to participate in again. We are going to be taking these elements individually, so don't feel like you've got to open your juice here in advance and hold that and not spill and all that. We'll take the bread first, and then we'll pause, and we'll take the cup together as we seek to navigate using these uh, these new elements here. You can, I encourage you, once you're done with the the cup at the end here you can simply put it back in this little baggie and be able to throw it out Um, in any of your rooms here on campus there's a trash by the door and you can toss that on your way out now many of our people are at home this morning but i trust that they are able to participate 
possibly in this as well as we do this together. So we are first going to take the bread, and let me just remind us of the verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as the Apostle Paul lays out what this is symbolizing. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 and 24, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember our Lord and celebrate our unity together. Let's take the bread together. Now let's take the cup and carefully and slowly open it if you haven't already. And now listen to the words of the Apostle Paul, continuing in that passage, 1 Corinthians 11. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's proclaim that together. Indeed, in Christ, our unity together is a creation of His Spirit. It is unique. It is supernatural. But we must be eager to maintain it with all of our effort. May God give us the grace to continue to fight for our unity and that we might be a stronger church in the days and weeks ahead. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do ask that you would please continue to bring us together as a church. Our separation over the intervening months has been difficult. It's been difficult to not see one another, to not sing together, to not take communion together. And yet we thank you, Lord, that we have been able to begin that this morning. I pray, Father, that as our nation is in turmoil, as there are any number of divisive issues that could creep their way into our fellowship, we ask, O oh God, that you would please protect us. That you'd help each one of us to repent and to lay aside of our selfishness and our pride. Help us to consider each other is more significant than ourselves. Help us to love with the love with which you have loved us, sacrificially. Father, we need your spirit to work it in us. Left up to ourselves in our own flesh, we will continue to push for our own agendas, to push for our own opinions and preferences. But Father, we ask in the power of the Spirit, you might preserve Foothill Bible Church to be more unified. More unified, not just that we get along with one another, but that our hearts might be one, our minds one, pursuing the glory of God as we minister to each other and as we share the life-changing message of the gospel to a dying world. Father, we thank you for your love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.